You say you are morally obligated to do remarkable things. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, I think partly because life is so difficult and challenging that unless you give it everything you have, the chances are very high that it will embitter you and then you'll be a force for darkness and not good. And so, you know, the fact that life is short and can be brutal, can terrify you into hiding and avoiding, you can flip that on its head and understand that since you're all in anyways, you might as well take the risks that are adventurous. There isn't anything more adventurous than the truth. truth. So why is that a moral obligation? Well, if you hide and you don't let what's inside of you out and you don't bring into the world what you could bring and you become cynical and bitter, you will start doing very dark things. Not only will you not add to the world what you could add, but you'll start being jealous of people who are competent and doing well and work to destroy them. So that's the pathway to hell. Really. We need to separate out the distinction between fantasy and delusion. You do have a fantasy about the future. So you have to provisionally map the future. That's what a plan is. That doesn't make it a delusion. Like it becomes a delusion when the map bears no relationship to the underlying territory. So if you have a strategy for the future, you know, maybe let's say that your strategy for the future is that you have 5 million YouTube subscribers in three years. Well, you have no evidence of the strict sort that that's how it's going to be because anything could happen between now and three years from now, let's say. But there's no reason to call that a delusion. It's one hypothetically possible path of potential. And then you can make the sacrifices necessary to bring that about. So even though it's a fantasy because it maps something that isn't there, it's not a delusion. It's a delusion when you're ignoring elements of your own experience that would inform your fantasy more effectively. You're ignoring them so that you can live in a positive representation of the future without having to pay the appropriate price for it. The ultimate ideal is also the ultimate judge because the ultimate ideal is something against which you fall far short. And that might be so painful that you can barely stand it. But then what you do is you, two things I suppose, is you lower the ideal and you raise your estimation of your potential. And what do I mean by lower the ideal? Well, if you're comparing yourself to someone or even to a future self, and the gap is so painful that it paralyzes you, then you've created a dragon that you don't have the tools to master. And so what you have to do is you have to scale the dragon down to size and you want to scale the dragon down to size until it's a size that you are willing to move toward, however small that is. Now, you know, if you're here and your ideal is here and that gap is unbearable, then you reduce the gap and you reduce the gap and you're going to have to do that anyways because you're not going to move from where you are to perfect in one fell swoop, right? There's going to be incremental steps. So you have to fill in that, that hierarchy of progression with a high enough resolution representation so that you can start to move forward. There's another gospel comment that's very interesting. It's called the Matthew Principle. And the Matthew Principle is, to those who have everything, more will be given. And from those who have nothing, everything will be taken. Now it's brutal because it implies that reality works like this. When you're moving up, you go like this, right? And that's pretty nice. That's a lot better than this. But when you're going down, you go like that, right? It's like downhill, downhill, cliff. Okay, so you want to avoid the downhill path. Well, if the uphill path is like this, which is like exponential, let's say, or geometric, then what that means is that it doesn't matter how big the first steps you take uphill are, even if they're trivial, even if they're shameful in their size, because you're so useless, if you're disciplined in that, you'll speed up extraordinarily rapidly. And so that's the good news, you might say, is that you can take very small steps, even ones that might be shameful in their size, and you have to admit that to yourself. But once you get the ball rolling, it doesn't roll in a linear fashion, it rolls in a geometric fashion. And this is a really good thing to know because it can take the sting out of the realization of your own stupidity. It's like, yeah, you know, everybody has their weak sides, let's say, things they're embarrassed about. When I first started going to the gym, 
I was like 23 and I think I weighed 135 pounds and I was six foot one, very, very thin, 27 inch waist, something like that. And I smoked like mad and I drank too much. Like I wasn't in good shape. <laughs> the first attempts forward I took in the gym, I went to this swim exercise class. Jesus, it was me and this like really fat guy, young guy, probably not in any worse shape than me and like seven old women over 70 and they could outswim me. Like it was pretty damn humiliating. And so I did a semester of that and got myself in somewhat better shape. And then I started to go to the gym to work out, to lift weights. And that was also rough because, you know, I'd be underneath the bloody bench press trying to lift 75 pounds off the rests. And, you know, some muscle headed bastard would come over and tell me how to do it. And it's like, yeah, thank you. But you know, it's embarrassing and lots of times people won't do things like go to the gym because they're so embarrassed about how they look or what sort of shape they're in. And it's a pain to start at the bottom, but you start at the bottom where you're weak. And if you want to rectify what's weak, you have to accept the fact that you're at the bottom and that the first steps are going to be painful. You know, it took me about three years, but I stopped smoking and then I stopped drinking and I gained 40 pounds of muscle in like three and a half years, something like that. I basically had to stop doing that because I had to eat like six times a day. It was crazy. But I got a lot more physically confident and a lot more coordinated. But the point of all this is if you're going to rectify your weaknesses, you have to admit your insufficiency to your own shame. Now, if the gap between you and your ideal is so great that it paralyzes you, you shrink that. Things will beckon to you and call to you, and you'll have intuitions about which pathway to take. And you will, in all likelihood, follow those, because what else do you have? You have these orienting instincts. This is another reason why you don't lie. Because if you lie and you practice lying, you pathologize your instincts, and then your intuitions lead you wrong. And so there's a sin that's laid out in the Gospels. It's the sin against the Holy Ghost. And it's unforgivable. And people have been debating for like 2,000 years about what this particular sin is. But it's something like the pathologization of the instincts that orient you. Like if you sacrifice your relationship to the truth, you warp your vision. And then you can't see. And then one day it'll be dark and there'll be sharp things in the fog in front of you. And you'll wander right into them because you've pathologized your own vision. Yeah. You, d you don't want to lie because you program yourself falsely and then you automatically see what isn't there. And then of course the world will slap you in the face continually and you'll think, oh my God, the world's such a pathological place. When the truth of the matter is, is that no, you just keep running into things that you refuse to see. And then you think, well, the world's made of nothing but obstacles. It's like, well, you put the obstacles in your own path. And you did that by developing these complex self-serving delusions, a story that you tell other people about who you are that isn't true. You're trying to lay out a map that bears no relationship to reality. And you keep wondering why you wander off the path and into a pit. It's like, well, how could it be otherwise? People have commented to me many times about my bravery, and I, I, I don't like that. It's, it's not right. I'm afraid of different things than the typical person. Maybe that's a good way of thinking about it. I'm way more afraid of the consequences of saying something that's false or wandering off the appropriate path than I am of whatever consequences might come for saying what I believe and doing what I believe to be the case. I'm way more afraid of that. You know, I've been reading the Gospel of St. Matthew. I'm, I'm writing a book at the moment called We Who Wrestle With God. And one of the things Christ says to people continually is to not damage their vision, is to not put, that's the best way of putting it, don't occlude your eye. You can see what's in front of you if you're willing to see it. And if you're willing to see it, many of the terrible obstacles in life, you can just walk around. But if you blind yourself purposefully to follow your own narrow self-serving delusion, you're going to run into terrible things and terrible people and the terrible part of your own soul all the time. That's what you should be afraid of. You can't be isolated, alone, without responsibility and pursuing your hedonistic nonsense and not be insane and miserable. Those are all the same thing, right? 
And so, you know, it's got to the point, I've, I've said things that have made me somewhat unpopular, like it's very difficult for people to mature until they have a child. You find a huge part of what you are in that relationship. It makes you responsible, makes you grow up. It gives you the opportunity to mentor someone. You have someone around who's more important than you. Well, that's part of being mentally healthy. It's a huge part of it. This enterprise that I've helped put together, Alliance for Responsible Citizenship, we're trying to put forward a model of governance. It's called a subsidiary model. And the idea is that people have multiple social roles that scale. No, there's you. You should take care of yourself, integrate yourself, which means you can conduct yourself properly across the medium to long run. You're self-sustaining. Then you can maybe extend that to your partner and then to your family and then to your local community and then to broader communities as you become more and more competent and able to take on that responsibility. That's the alternative to isolated hedonic slavery. You slave to your own whims. And it's the alternative to tyranny because if you take on all that responsibility, you don't have any need for someone to govern you. It's truly the case that your sanity is the concordance between you as an individual and the world. That's the sanity. You're distributed out into the world and you should be. And that's, you wanna be. That's where the adventure is. You want to be solipsistic? The solipsistic porn masturbator. <laughs> Jesus, it's no wonder you be aimless and miserable. Well, God, it's so pathetic. Why am I so unhappy? It's because you think about yourself. Oh, no, you think about the lowest impulses in yourself all the time. That's why you're miserable. People exist in a sacrificial relationship to the world. What does that mean? It seems to mean something like human beings are aware of their extended self. You know you're going to be around tomorrow and next week and next month and next year and five years from now and 10 years from now. Now, it's less certain as you go out, but you do have the sense of yourself as something that stretches across the decades. Okay, and so what that means is that you have to conduct yourself in a manner that isn't merely immediate. You have to conduct yourself in a manner that will work across time. Now, how do people do that? They work. Work is a sacrificial gesture. So you work by definition, virtually. Work is the sacrifice of the present for the future. I mean, maybe someone can come up with a better definition of work than that, but I don't think so. It's like you, you put in time and effort right now, even if it's something not what you'd like to be doing at the moment, you put in time and effort because you believe, what the hell does that mean? You believe it'll pay off. Well, is that a contract with the future? Is it a covenant? Because the relationship that the biblical corpus characterizes human striving is covenantal. It's a bargain. The bargain is you make the right sacrifices and they pay off. That's the bargain. Now, you might say, well, that's just part of the social contract. But the biblical corpus insists that it's deeper than that. It's built into the structure of reality itself. And that if you got the sacrifices right, the future would be paradisal. That's a kind of sacrifice right there, is that you're willing to sacrifice your short-term physiological and psychological comfort for a medium to long-term benefit. It's the essence of sacrifice. This is something the atheists don't understand about the biblical narrative, is that the narrative insists that we live in a sacrificial relationship. It's the essence of humanity to live in a sacrificial relationship. It's like, well, is that true or not? Well, as you mature, your relationships are more sacrificial. It's less about what you, in your narrow sense, want right now, and it's more about what's good over the medium to long run, including other people. Well, that's a sacrificial relationship. Now, the covenant, you know, and this is a matter of faith. It's the matter of the deepest faith. Are you willing to act out the proposition that the way to make the world reveal itself to you in its most positive guise is for you to adopt the most appropriate sacrificial relationship? Well, it's a big risk, isn't it? Because you have to give up everything. That's the, that's the deal. You give up everything that's low, everything everything. Well, that's what the Christian passion is, because the Christian passion is an archetypal story because Christ is the person who sacrifices everything thoroughly, 100%. There's no indecision because you age, like you pay for your indecision. It's a decision. It's a decision to avoid fundamentally. You know, and part of the moral that's embedded in the story of Job and in the Christian passion is that you can master what you'll face. 
And maybe that's true. I mean, the clinical literature seems to indicate that it's true because one of the things you do if you're a competent clinician is you look at what people are attempting to accomplish and maybe that needs some retooling, but let's assume that they have a goal in mind that would work, right? You've talked it through with them strategically. They have a well laid out vision. Okay, now they're laying out the vision and they encounter impediments that stop them and maybe they're impediments that make them afraid and paralyze them. And so then what you do is you decompose the impediment until you find a way they can advance that constitutes a genuine advance that they'll actually do. So what you do is you take the problem and you narrow it until they'll face it. Okay, then they face it. Then what happens? They get more competent. That's what happens. And then they get better at facing all problems. So they don't just learn how to deal with that specific problem. They learn a lesson that generalizes across problems. They get braver. When you use exposure therapy, people don't get less afraid, they get braver. And that's way better because mm. braver, braver moves from situation to situation. Okay, so the question is, if you faced everything that was put in front of you, who would you be? Well, the answer, the biblical answer is you'd be a true son of God. That's the biblical answer. It's like, well, do you believe that? Well, it depends on what you mean by believe. Do you have a better bet than facing what's there? Well, you just have to be sensible about it for a moment. It's like, is your theory that you're going to adapt better using falsehood and avoidance? Because that's the contrary theory. You either face it and you do that predicated on the faith that something in you will respond if you do, or you don't face it. That's it. Those are the options. If you don't face it, that's faith too. That's faith in the notion that avoidance and deception will suffice. There's technically two different forms of reward. There's consumatory reward. That's what an orgasm is. It's consumatory reward. It brings the behavioral and perceptual sequence to a halt. It ends it, right? At the climax, it ends it. But then it's over. That journey is over, right? Then there's the dopaminergic reward. And dopaminergic reward is evidence of advancement towards a goal, right? Okay, so, so there's a corollary to that. Well, how do you become optimally engaged? Because dopamine facilitates engagement and focus, which is why drugs like amphetamines can be used for kids who are attention deficit disordered. You tap up the dopamine response, they lock on, right? Okay, so they're locking on to a goal-directed pursuit. The problem with amphetamines is that they can lock you on so hard you can't get out of the frame. So like kids on amphetamines will obsess, for example, about cleaning up their closet. They can't switch to the next activity. Okay, dopaminergic reward is reward that's accrued in relationship to a goal. Okay, so what's an implication of that? Well, pursue the highest possible goal. Well, why? Because the kick from advancement is higher. Now, you have to balance that. It can't be, you have to advance, right? Because imagine the reward's got two components. Number one is you're moving towards something valuable. Okay, so you want it to be as valuable as possible. Okay, but you have to be moving. You need something extremely valuable that you can move towards. Okay, so part of the reason that you establish a relationship with God, let's say, is because that's what sets the upper bound to your vision. It's like, I want things to be the best they could be. That's a vision of paradise. Well, that has to be fractionated into, you know, your proximal decisions, but lurking behind that should be this continual movement towards, what would you say, a heaven that recedes as you approach it. That's the proper vision of heaven. A heaven is a place that's perfect and getting better both at the same time. That's what music shows you because a great piece of music is perfect, but it's just getting better as it unfolds. And, and you need that. This is part of the problem with a static utopian vision, something Dostoevsky criticized. If you gave people nothing but consumatory reward, he famously says, so that they can do nothing but sit in tubs of hot water, eat cake and busy themselves with the continuation of the species. Human beings would break that all to hell in a moment just so they have something interesting to do. If you run yourself through a disciplinary process, so you accomplish something, maybe you don't attain the goal you were aiming at, but you accrue a new way of looking at the world and a set of skills. Well, if you just keep doing that, you have multiple ways of looking at the world and more and more skill. Well, that's that's your storehouse of treasure. As you walk through life in your normal mode, things will call to you. And if you pursue them, they will take you deep. It doesn't really matter what it is that calls. What matters is that you pursue it 
and you, you pursue it to the depths. And as you pursue it to the depths, you will become transformed. And if you do that without reservation, that will turn you into the person who frees the slaves and opposes the tyrants. And that is how it works. That's the call. And that can happen in any direction, virtually any direction. You just have to pursue it with sufficient faith.